you know, this is kind of behind everything that we've been saying. It's just, just like make good music, you know, like there's no better marketing plan than making good music, right? There's nothing that's going to endear you more to, to potential fans than making good music. Yo, what's up? This is Toru. And in a way, so are you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a music producer, artist, and entrepreneur. I make music for that space between the dance floor and the bedroom, which has been streamed millions of times and been licensed by brands big and small, including companies like Apple. I believe that regardless of what you produce, whether it be music, art, physical goods, or even spreadsheets, you have a process, whether you know it or not. To explore this further, I created the Producer Head podcast. Producer Head is a place to have conversations with other producers about their experience and process to share what works and what doesn't, to help each of us learn and improve our own processes along the way. Welcome to part two of this two-part episode with Brandon Rowan, aka Bureaucratic. In case you missed part one of this conversation, Bureaucratic is a Brooklyn-based producer making sample-based beats in the vein of 70s funk and old-school New York hip-hop, augmented with live-recorded bass guitar and synthesizer. Bureaucratic's Beats albums, that's B-E-E-T-S, have topped the Bandcamp hip-hop charts. And Bureaucratic has toured the U.S. multiple times, including stops at venues like Red Rocks in Colorado. He's even co-written songs with Grammy award-winning artists. If you have not already, I cannot recommend enough that you check out part one of this conversation where we discussed approaching your creative process through a place of excitement and fun versus hard work, lessons learned from giving lessons to other producers, motivation, making money and its place in artistic development, and of course, our mini listening session where we played a couple of tracks and talked about what we heard. Again, go ahead and tap in. Now, in part two of this conversation, we discussed the importance of establishing your own purpose, appreciating the amount of work behind the scenes of others who appear to be ahead of you, building relationships through collaboration, the state of streaming as it relates to beats, building an audience of true fans of what you do, and finally, how Bureaucratic went from making beats in his dorm room to catching a buzz and developing his career. As you'll hear throughout this conversation, Bureaucratic has a deep passion for making music. He continues to explore and expand his horizons while spreading motivation and encouragement to others around him. This conversation is full of ideas that help keep you moving forward. All right. Part two of this conversation with Bureaucratic begins now. It's a tough game to get into. Like, probably don't go into music if you just want to make money, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> maybe there are better things to do with your time, but it is a fun way to uh, to spend your time, I will say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think some of what you're saying makes me think of the importance of really creating your own set, like, sense of purpose around what it is that you do it and why you do it. Because mm-hmm. if you immediately get into it because you heard something that you like, which is true for I think most people that make music is they've heard a number of things that inspire them to put something back into all of it which is beautiful Mm -hmm. however when you start to then measure the validity of your own music or your contributions based on whether or not it shows up next to other people's music on a screen on a streaming platform and whether that's you know even really how you want to value it like you get to decide that and so I think that is that is important but to immediately adopt the number where you show up on a playlist or how many plays are next to your song on a streaming platform is to kind of adopt somebody else's value system for, for the validity of your music, I think, oftentimes. So it is a Absolutely. hard question to ask yourself, and I don't know that there's like a really straightforward answer for everybody. But I do also think that anybody t- that tells you that they have an answer for you is, is somebody to be listened to with you know, healthy skepticism as well. For sure. I think you just got to be in it for reasons that like make you happy regardless of the external, you know, validation. If you want to do it for a long time. And if you don't, if you just want to like mess around and like see what's up, go for it. You know, like this is not to to knock anyone. Like every approach is is valid here, but I just I I do see a lot of struggle, like internal struggle with a lot of the people that I talk to just through like production discords and and lessons that I teach and stuff and it's like, you know, why is this not hitting and well, is ha- like how important is that? Like, really? Like, are you are you are you having fun? You know? And I think that you know, there's there's a larger point you could you could draw here about like content and and gamifying, you know, and how our culture, at least in the United States, um, which is a very dominant media culture, like how it gamifies and encourages people to like, you know, commodify their hobby. But I, I do think that like the state of the music world. And most art would be better off if um, people just made stuff they like for the sake of it and didn't really try too hard to conform to what's out there, for, you know, for the sake of approval. I guess the last thing I'd like to say about this is, I think, you know, you see somebody else's 
who's a supposedly streaming well, for instance, on Spotify mm-hmm. and looks like they have good traction. And so, but what you can't see is like what that person's actually doing and, and what their life looks like and how they got there, et cetera. And so I think that might be a cool place to kind of jump into like how it kind of started to materialize for you because you have a pretty cool and interesting story to get to where you are. Oh, I'm glad you think so. So for me, my, my, my career started, I guess it really jumped off around like 2013. There's, there's a moment. I think, I think a lot of people, maybe you feel this way too. Like, is there like a moment in your career where you feel like something just kind of like, like there was like a defined decision or like a, like a, an outreach or something that just like kind of everything changed after that? I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting question. I think sometimes like in hindsight, I feel like I look back at things and go, oh, like that was really impactful. Mm-hmm. But in the moment, I don't think I was able to necessarily see it with that perspective and understand it that way. Totally. Oh, well, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, to have that sort of perspective, like when you're in it, for sure. Yeah. It's definitely something that you look back on and can see a little bit more clearly. But I guess that moment for me was, was, I, it was, would have been February, I guess, of like 2013. Mm-hmm. Basically, I was making beats and releasing them on SoundCloud just from my dorm room. And, I didn't know anything about marketing or anything like that. I was just putting them out. They'd get a few hundred plays, you know, probably had like high hundreds of followers on SoundCloud back when SoundCloud was like the thing, you know, maybe the, the beats get like a thousand plays, 2000 plays or something. I'd be so stoked about it, dude. It was like, oh my God, across a thousand. That's sick. One day I just noticed like prior to that, I was, I, for some reason I was like, you know what? I, I'm, I'm sampling this music. It's not, it's not legal you know, technically, let me just, and this was completely flawed logic. I don't know what, what I was actually thinking, but I was like, let me, let me mark these all as creative commons just so that like, I'm not claiming full ownership is what I thought I was doing by, by, by sharing my music via creative commons. That's not what that means. That's not at all what that means. I was 18. I needed a lawyer, you know, like (laughs) this was not, this was faulty logic. And I think it just, I was just doing it to make myself feel better about like sampling. Right. You know, and mind you, I went to school, right? I went to school for music and I was one of the only, I think I was the only person in my program who was like sampling music. So I felt kind of like, ooh, this is kind of like, this would be frowned upon. Like the industry doesn't like take kindly to this. And I kind of like go to a school that's like pretty, it's like funded by the industry in a a big way. So I'm like, ooh, okay. Like maybe if I do this, you know, it's creative commons. Like it's not, don't worry. Like it's not mine. You can use it. It's fine. Very silly. But anyway, that decision to, to release my music via Creative Commons led to this guy, Henry Goldman, who's a, a senior video producer at BuzzFeed when they were like starting off back in 2013. He, he was searching SoundCloud for Creative Commons licensed beats and found mine and started putting my music in these videos that BuzzFeed was producing. If you guys remember, like, I mean, I'm dating myself here. This is like 11 years ago, but BuzzFeed was starting off. They, they would like make these videos like, you know, six things only lefties would understand. <laughs> it was just like every identity you could possibly imagine yeah. identifying as they'd like have a video, a list video and my music would be in there and, and, and several other people as well had their beats in there. And it was just like reaching hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people all of a sudden. So I noticed this giant uptick in my SoundCloud plays and I was like, what's going on, dude? Like I had no idea. They didn't reach out to me or anything. It's just all of a sudden I was like, what's up? So eventually a few weeks later, they, uh, this guy, Henry reached out to me and he was like, yo, been using your music. I'm like, I noticed. Yeah, man. Thank you. And we developed a relationship where I would send him beats when they would be released. And all I would ask for is just credit in the video. I was like, you know what? I can't ask for being paid. These are creative commons. You know, like I can't ask him to pay me. He probably wouldn't pay me anyway, but let me just get credit. And just all these eyes and ears that are on the video, like maybe I can capture some of that audience. And I would point them towards Bandcamp actually. Mm -hmm. Because Bandcamp, you can monetize. So I'd like, you know, encourage people. It was, a, it was a free download, but it was like, yo, you can pay if you want. Mm-hmm. And I started to make a little bit of money off of that. I was like, whoa, okay. People are hearing this. They're intrigued. They actually make the effort to go purchase this music. I'm like, yo, these are like fans. Like, that's crazy. And so from there, I was like, wait, this is like a strange opportunity. So let me see what I can do off of this and like really, you know, try to reach these people. And, and just like thank them for, for listening and supporting because it was just like crazy to me all of a sudden. Um, so that, that was kind of the moment that like things really changed for me was just being in that first video. And from there, I just started to realize like there's a lot of YouTubers out there who 
make videos who could use some background music. And so I just started doing a ton of outreach, just shameless, like, yo, I make music. I think you might like it, you know, and this is pre like epidemic sound. This is pre like, you know, having these like large companies that you can get like an eight ninety nine a month subscription and get all the music you could possibly want. Super easy. It was kind of the wild west. So I was just like doing crazy outreach, just hitting up everyone, camera influencers and travel vloggers, big in the vlog world for whatever reason. And just hitting people up and be like, yo, like, here's my music for free. Like, I'll send you stickers. You know, here's a link. Like, thank you. And one out of every 20 would bite. And then, you know, we'd get some views and it was cool. And it was a nice self-sustaining machine for a while. So it was cool. Very, very cool, man. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a, it is crazy to like look back and think on that time. But I think connected to what we were saying before, I think, again, somebody could look at your Spotify and see the streaming numbers, which are very respectable and not understand that look like I've been BuzzFeed was 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then before that, you know, you were making beats in your dorm room for X number of years to get them to a point where somebody at a place like that could even find them in the first place. So I think like if there's one piece of encouragement we can offer people here, it's one is like, try to just be good and like your own music, like get to a place where Mm -hmm. you really feel like you're making things that you actually want to listen to maybe more so than you want to listen to other music. I remember like Stolen Drums once said, like, I mean, he was making beats and he got to a point where he was like, where it tipped over and he was like, wow, like I want to listen to my music right now more than I want to listen to other stuff. And so to really like kind of really like listening to your own music, I think is a really powerful idea. And also like to be once once you get to that point to like really share it because you never know who's listening, you know. And so and also to your point, to be thoughtful and strategic about it, given the time that you're in, you know, and I think really like tactically maybe it's going to be different now because of like you said the rise of certain platforms you took action based on your understanding of what was available at the time and i think all of that is kind of conceptually what can be applied going forward no matter kind of where you are so true man it's you know and and look like we were just talking about youtube but like tiktok has replaced youtube in in a big way you can do the same thing on tiktok if you're if you're starting and you're making beats hit people up and just be like, yo, I would love, like, it would be awesome if you used my song in one of your edits. It can be like anyone, anyone that you like, or or if it's like a different hobby that you have, you hit up a creator and just say, hey, like, what's up? Start a conversation, start a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, everyone wants to have cool music behind Mm -hmm. their videos, whether that's trending stuff or something that they feel maybe they're like excited to work with a, a smaller creator, you know, a smaller independent Music yeah. maker, beat maker, whatever. There's so many opportunities. There's like, like a dizzying number of opportunities available to us at any given point. Um, and I think, I think the, the moral of that story is just like, man, just start relationships, you know? Reach out to people you, 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 you like who are in different fields and, and see if there's something you can work together on. Again, I think that speaks to like, you know, being honest like with where you are and what you mm-hmm. can do, you know? And that's, that's really important. And maybe let's not send each other messages that just say, let's work. Okay. You try it and see how, you know, how far it gets you. But yeah, there's, there's probably more you can offer than yeah. just like a general, like, here's the, the, the lowest tier interest mm-hmm. that I can, that I can show you. Like, come yeah. On. Yeah. To, Maybe. I mean, yeah, to, to your point, I mean, I think it's, you know, to, to approach it from a place of thinking, if this goes somewhere, I'm trying to build a relationship with somebody mm-hmm. and that it's less transactional in a sense. Totally. And even if it is, I mean, like, you know, so much of the culture of, of, you know, marketing and and whatnot today is transactional and like, that's okay too. just recognize that like, like if you're able to provide more than just that, if it is able to go there, you know, like have some more depth than just like, yo, here's 20 bucks, like throw my song in the back of your video. Like, that's cool. But if they come back to you and you're like, Hey, I really like this. Like be able to say like, yo, why don't we work out like a, a bigger deal? Like, Let's like email, you know, let's like call, you know, just like, let's talk. Like we are, we're people, we do this, you know, like, let's just try to help each other out here. Yeah. Um, and really, you know, I think one of the things that I, I am proud of that I, that I did was I really tried to focus on seeing things from the perspective of these creators and making it as frictionless and as easy and as fun as possible mm-hmm. for them to get involved in using my beats. 
So I like set up a whole website. I was like, yo, just like head here. You know, they download something and in, in, in the email, there would be this like stupid, like, well, thank you. And I'd be like, yo, you're sick. Like, you know, just like yeah. those little moments. It's like kind of customer service in a way, but you're really like, you, you're just, you're, you're trying to build a relationship. You're trying to make someone feel good about teaming up with you. How can you show them that you care? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being yeah. genuine and appreciative. And I mean, I, I think it also speaks to valuing what you do. I think if you're somebody who makes music, you're very aware of how much there is around and how many other people are making it because that's what you pay the most attention to. And so in a sense, it can be, I think, maybe easy to overlook its value or to be constantly comparing it to other people. But mm -hmm. like you said, if somebody actually really appreciates your music, it's meaningful, you know, and so that you can be reminded of that and to For approach sure. it as something you can really contribute to somebody else's project as well. Absolutely, man. So I guess connected to your career is also like kind of this, this chill hop piece. Mm -hmm. And so can you kind of speak to, so, you know, for those who don't know, you know, chill hop music is a pretty prominent label in the space based mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, if I remember correctly. And you have kind of been with them, you know, since the beginning, essentially, if I understand correctly. So maybe you can like kind of speak to how that came about and the role that they're playing and how that impacts kind of where we are. It's, it's sort of a big topic, but we can kind of chop it up here. Yeah, for sure. So Chill Hop is, they've been a label since 2015. And before that, they were a YouTube channel that was basically, it was run by one guy, this guy Boss, and he was just committed to reposting music and like mixes of music that he thought was really cool, like chilled out hip hop beats which at the time was kind of hard to find in a, in a consolidated place. And he really took it upon himself to make it cool and easy and fun to, to listen to that kind of music. And, and he was like, he was a skater. So it like really factored into that lifestyle for him. And it was, you know, something that he would put on these mixes when he was skating, as far as I understand. And like, you know, so it played a real role in his life and he he got really passionate about it. He's also a very smart businessman. And so when he realized that he was, you know, he was able to, start a label and start releasing his own music own the music that he is then promoting rather than promoting other people's music he started to realize that there's a real like value add that he could provide to the space and so in 2015 he reached out to me and he was like yo we've been mutually like aware of each other we just hadn't really like pierced the veil of of communicating but he, he reached out and he was like hey really love your stuff we're, we're starting a label just curious if you'd be down to like provide an artist perspective. Like we, we, we think you have like a, a good brand and like you seem to have your stuff together. <laughs> I'm grateful he felt that way because, uh, because it started honestly one of the, the probably the longest lasting like professional relationship. And, and since then personal relationship, Boz is a good friend of mine of my career so far and chill hop being there at the beginning, like, oh, man, I, we used to, I used to do some A&R work for them before they hired a full-time A&R. I used to master you know, they, they, they would put out compilations every season called The Essentials. And I used to master all those compilations, all the albums that they would put out, they would commission from, from artists that they liked. And, you know, eventually it just grew. I mean, Boss is a very, very smart individual. He knew how to market it. He knew how to get eyes and ears on his channel. So it went from a YouTube channel to owning Spotify playlists that have over a million followers now. You know, every, every opportunity he could, he was pushing people in the right direction, you know. So being there, you know, from... Basically, square one of the label was, again, lucky timing, you know, being there in the right place, right time, and just being open to like, yeah, dude, let's do it. Let's like, let's form a relationship, whatever makes sense together. Now, I've had so many roles uh, related to Chill Hop. I've, you know, I did that a &R early on. I did mastering for a while. Then I went on tour for a while, so I couldn't really keep up with the mastering as, as consistently as I was. So kind of relinquished that role and they found somebody else to do it. And then eventually like years later, I wind up in the Netherlands and I start helping them like build their studio out uh, in their office. And cause they, you know, had this unfinished studio in the basement. I'm like, guys, like, this is awesome. Let's like grab the gear. Let's book some sessions. Like let's, let's get this thing going. And so it just, you know, like again, on the relationship piece, it was just like, you know what? I like these guys. I like boss. I have a ton of respect for them what they do. They've, been an enormous help in my career and connecting me with, with other musicians, great people, like, uh, you know, and also just like, they've provided a lot of stability for me. And that was a big, big part of their mission. So yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a constant give and take and, and it's just sick to be involved with this company and this crew of people. Like I love them so much. Yeah. 
That's, I mean, that's such a cool story, man. And again, I mean, just to, and I mean, I'm, I'm kind of saying it over and over again, but just to the point that like, I think a lot of us start and we're like, okay, how do I get that relationship? Instead of thinking like, I mean, th- that was something that came about as a result of like kind of having a bunch of quality work publicly mm-hmm. visible over an extended period of time, you know? And that's something sure. that, it, I mean, it's, it's never particularly an exciting answer, but, you know, taking a more long-term view and being patient and really just, again, like feeling like you're making music that you can be proud of and how important and how valuable that is, regardless of whether or not you make money from it, is a really fulfilling feeling. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, man. Um, hey, man, just, just kind of saying what you're saying here. So I guess... Chill Hop was kind of, I mean, at least as far as I've been able to tell, like they were kind of the first ones to do what they did. And so in the space, and so I'm kind of, you know, that's obviously kind of inspired others to do similar things and recreate their versions of that, of a similar model. So I wonder if you can speak on, okay, like that's how it started, I guess, as they would say. And like, so how's it going and where are we now? It's interesting, man. I think we're at an interesting time in the, you know, air quotes, lo-fi space. I suppose there's definitely been a downturn, it feels like, in the overall interest and like streaming numbers and whatnot. I think, uh, I think lo fi was pretty ubiquitous for a while. And from what I understand, and also just kind of how I feel like we got a little tired of it, like it's just kind of a, it's kind of a meme in a, in a big way. Like there's a lot of jokes about the lo fi study girl and everything. And, it's kind of found its place in society and, and in public consciousness as like a sweeping genre. And I think it's, it's harder because it's not to put it down or anything, but it's like, it's a fairly accessible genre of music to make. And so a lot of people will start making lo-fi beats. Like they'll, they'll begin their music career being like, oh, let me do this. You know, let me try this. And um, so it's very saturated. So you have a lot of people vying for not a lot of space and not a ton of listeners. And the other piece of this too, that we can get into a little bit more is that a lot of these are, you know, quote unquote, like lean back listeners or or passive listeners, you know, it's hard in this, in this particular space because it's often seen and used as background music, right? Much to our streaming numbers benefit, but less so to our development of relationships with fans. It's hard to make fans in this particular world because you're not reaching people super directly. You're not really grabbing their attention, which of course, as if you look around now, it's like, well, everything kind of needs to be attention grabbing uh, more so than the next thing on the feed in order to, you know, you know, pierce that veil and, 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 you know, endear yourself to someone. As far as like discovery goes, it's, it's tough now. Even for, even for friends of mine who have been doing this for a long time, for myself, like it's, it's just a different game. It's not that it's tough. It's a different game. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes and like what happens with these artists. I don't know what your experience is with this, but it feels like there was a model that worked for five-ish years, you know, through live streams on YouTube and the Spotify playlists. And, you know, you press play and you listen to six hours of music while you're working. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh... You know, and in the meantime, like in the background, those those artists are racking up streams. Uh, so it's so, interesting. Yeah, it, it is. And so I guess given that, I'm like, do you have a sense or a feeling for how important it is for artists to prioritize partnering with these types of labels if that this is the scene in which they exist? How important it is. I, I suppose it's important, but it's not like essential. Um, it shouldn't be the thing you hang your hat on. Probably. I mean, maybe, you know, it depends how, how deep that relationship goes. Um, you know, I, I don't, I know a lot of people, myself included, who like also work for these labels in capacities other than just making music. Sure. Like th- these labels are organizations. They need help. Sometimes they need, they benefit from an artist's perspective. So, you know, if there's something you can offer them outside of just like, you know, making music, like, Hey, let me do some A&R, like whatever, you know, you can be involved in that way and that will deepen your relationship probably faster and and more profoundly than just creating a lot of music for this label will um but i think also it's important to recognize that like you call it a scene Mm. it's it's an interesting scene because it's so online Mm -hmm. 
it's just a completely online thing. And it's harder to develop the deeper relationships with those online. It takes a long time and longer than if you are able to meet up with people in person, just straight up, you know, where like scenes originally came from. It's like, it'd be a city, you know, be a couple venues and parties that were like touching and, you know, they were striking a nerve. And now it happens, but it's so spread out. So finding a way to coalesce those things, that's sort of the, the important thing, I think now. And, you know, like we, we know each other uh, are, are like big on Discord, right? Discord, I think, is one of those places where scenes can really like grow and develop now. So that I think is just as important, like being part of a community, being a, a, an important community member, learning, I think is, is super important now in this scene. Yeah, I really agree with that, man. And as you were describing... You know, I kind of said scene, just not knowing what other word to use. But then as you started to describe that, it just made me think, you know, like, have you ever read that David Burns book, How Music Works? You know what, dude? It's like sitting right there. And I uh, have not. I wow. have not so it's, it's, been, it. it's been a while. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's a really interesting book and mm-hmm. it's been a while since I've read it. But the scene thing, for whatever reason, really stuck with me. Mm-hmm. And because he spends a good bit in that time talking about how much it's about being in the same place and and like how it's about like you define the quality of a scene based on what actually happens locally in a city, not based on like who stops by on a tour. You know what I mean? Like right. that, that more so speaks to the quality of, of a scene of music in a particular place. Right. And that really always stuck with me. And I think to your point about now where we are in terms of this being an online thing and discord and all of that, that something that is really interesting to keep in mind is that something that Austin Kleon says in his book is like, you know, meet your internet friends, you know, in real life. And I will say that, you know, I have had the, the opportunity, like, I remember when I was first starting out, maybe this kind of answers your question. Like, I remember when I was first starting out and being like, I'm never going to meet any of these people. You know, I was like, I know mm. them sometimes, like, but like, and now I've come to like, I, I've met these people online. And I mean, in real life that I originally met online and are now people that I know and have a relationship even with beyond the music. And that to all that we've been speaking of is very meaningful and does, in my opinion, speak to like a larger shift in the own, like kind of course of my life yeah and absolutely yeah yeah very very sorry cool. were you gonna continue no man i've said enough so <laughs> to to that end um so i, I do want to kind of touch on a little bit because so we've you know the labels is, is one route and mm-hmm. i think if i were going to speak to maybe one particular like something that's at risk in that place in the same way that it's at risk like on on social media platforms and stuff is that you don't necessarily have that direct connection I like the, the idea of lean back listeners. It's sort of like you don't, that part is, that's, that's really hard. So in terms of building an audience as an artist, you know, what are your feelings on that? Feelings on that are lean back listeners are like step one. Mm. Like we shouldn't get distracted by trying to be the best, you know, or get the highest numbers in step one. To that end, there's a stat on Spotify that I'm sure that you've seen. They make it very, very visible called monthly listeners. Mm. Um, I've heard of it. Yeah. If you're in this game in any way, you've probably heard of it. It's, it's like first and foremost, it's in your bio. It's at the top of your profile. It's a very funny number because it doesn't reflect, I find, and a lot of people in the industry find, it doesn't really reflect the size. It doesn't necessarily reflect the size of your following. Following. It just is the number of people that are listening to you in an average month or in the last month. And what that can mean is that number can be super inflated based on someone deciding after listening to your one beat for 10 seconds that it belongs in their playlist. It can be such a spur of the moment thing by someone you don't know. And all of a sudden you have this number go up and it can make you feel really good. But it doesn't mean that you're reaching people necessarily. What I would say, there's opportunity in, and like people aren't necessarily, at least in the scene, right? As as beat makers, are not necessarily as focused on that. I think there's a lot of opportunity for for like developing, is really just like developing fans. Like who? Like what's a fan? Like what? what, Who are you a fan of? Uh, I'm asking you, Julian. Like who are you a fan of, and how are you a fan? Yeah. Wow. So many. So I mean, I guess. Lately, I've been listening a lot to that that new Use of Days album. True. The the black classical music for anybody who hasn't already. I mean, dude, I've been <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I love it. Mm-hmm. But and he was actually just down here a few weeks ago, so I got to see him live, which was which was great. 
Awesome. And, but yeah, I mean, so how did I, I would say probably like, I can't, I can't give like a truly precise answer, but Mm -hmm. through some, to your point, like probably originally kind of lean back, maybe he did something with Tom Mish or somebody else. Oh Mm -hmm. no. Or like the, you know, the, the use of the black focus, the use of Mm -hmm. Kamal stuff. I think that's the first place ever heard him. And I love that album. Right. So I used to listen to black focus like every day at my old job. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, and then I didn't even realize that that, you know, and then that was Kamal Williams, Henry Wu slash use of days. And then, so, um, but that's the thing is like when, and then I just love that music. And then I think I've just in some way been aware of his existence since then. Right. Cool. And what keeps you going back? It's a good question, man. I mean, I I think it's just, I, the music just hits for me for whatever reason, you know, it really, it it really just does. Because I, I don't know that much about him. He's not somebody that I've read a ton about. And I haven't watched all of his videos. I don't like, I, yeah, I just, I just really like the music. I mean, that album is incredible to me. Mm-hmm. But yeah. both Black Focus and Black Classical Music, both of those, like, incredible. Hell yeah. So yeah, I mean, that, that speaks to your point that, okay. And, and, you know, this is kind of behind everything that we've been saying. It's just, just like make good music, you know, yeah, like yeah. there's no better marketing plan than making good music, right? Yeah. There's nothing that's going to endear you more to, to potential fans than making good music. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously good is entirely subjective. Sure. To, to a degree. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> like the, if you're not impressing yourself, mm-hmm. it's going to be hard to impress others. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be hard to gather someone's attention enough that they'd be willing to, you know, they say... They, like, let's imagine this, right? Like you're working at your old job and song from Black Focus comes on. You've never heard it. And you're like, it actually distracts you from your job because you like it so much. And you're like, yo, what is this? And you go to the profile of the artists and you say, oh, they have other stuff out. Sick. I'm going to check that out when I get some time. Or I'm going to queue this up after this playlist is done or whatever. And I'm going to see what's good there. And if you continue liking what you see, there's depth there. There's catalog. You can go on YouTube and see a live rendition of some of that music. You can see Kamal Williams and Yusuf Days playing together. You can see music videos now. You can see videos recorded at Joshua Tree. You know, Yusuf Days experience just did that or last year. You know, so there's like, there's like depth there that if you're interested in more, it's like, oh, cool. Oh, you know what? I like this person so much. I'm going to go see them live. I like them so much, even if they're not coming to my city, I'm going to grab a hoodie because I want to mm. show, I want to proudly support this person, mm-hmm. music. And if those things didn't exist, I wonder, even if you did like the music, how much you would really be able to call yourself a fan, right? Mm. Does that yeah. make sense? Like, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Having the opportunity to like deepen and like engage in more things over time is really going to help you, you know, develop that relationship with this person whether or not you're talking directly to them or you're just like consuming and supporting. You know what I mean? So I think, I think it's really important to focus on, obviously the quality of the music is, is paramount. It's just like the first and foremost thing, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, being everywhere and having, having ways to, to reach people on every platform and, and with different vibe, you know, like you, you, you want to be able to create the kind of depth of following that that will make someone happy and proud and like stoked to be your fan and share it with someone. That's kind of that's kind of my metric for for developing a following. Yeah, are you familiar with uh, the Kevin Kelly one thousand fan theory? I am, but I would love to hear. I find it to be sort of like antithetical to a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of just get that top line number as big as you possibly can. I guess I would describe it in my, at least the way that I kind of feel about the way that these two things are like kind of opposed, a shallow and short-term view versus like a deep and slow long-term view. Right. You know, so I don't know if, I mean, it's very easy to make the numbers work. And for those that don't know, I mean, I would obviously very much recommend that you read this if this kind of thing interests you at all. But the overarching idea is just that, okay, if you can have a thousand true fans and Mm -hmm. each of them were to provide you with a hundred dollars of support on an annual basis, that in theory, you would have a hundred thousand dollars and you can toggle, you know, the number of fans up and down and the amount of that each fan contributes up and down, depending on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, it's a, it's a much more digestible and realistic kind of path in my mind. I'm not saying Mm -hmm. it's easy. 
but right. it is also something that is more tangible and I think easier to like keep yourself from kind of crumbling under than thinking yeah. about how do I get to a million monthly listeners or how do I get to a million followers on spot on a Spotify or on Instagram. Right. It's actually in your control. It's attainable, right? It's like a thousand true fans is, is something that you, it's, it's not as daunting. And it's very much, you know, not in everyone else's hands. Like you can decide to do the things I think that would lead you to finding people who would be willing to spend a hundred bucks on your, you know, music, your output, your creativity in an average year. Um, and a lot of that required, what's that? No, I mean, I just, yeah, it's super interesting. And I, I guess what it makes me think back on is kind of what we've been talking about to some extent, the level of like, what's your purpose? Like, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. Because that that's again to me asking yourself the most challenging question because yeah. if you why are you doing it and that will kind of explain a lot of your behavior or why you're why you're frustrated or why you're not or what you're excited about and because it has a lot to do with the expectations that you have about what you're doing and what's happening around you absolutely yeah and you'll find yourself either being really intrigued by the opportunity to develop a large following and and to interact with people in that way mm -hmm. or or not you know right but yeah i mean i think i think it's really yeah it's obviously very important to understand why you're doing these things and why you're you're interested in this mm -hmm. and and you know i guess what i what i see a lot of you know in in the lo-fi community is like a default of just like i it should i should reach people right i should like be getting numbers it's like well maybe mm. But, you know, well, let's investigate that maybe a little bit. Like, you know, maybe it would be good for, for everyone that like, we just, okay, like what, what's up? Like, are we just making beats for fun? Or are we making, you know, like what's this expectation coming from? So yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's my word on that. Is there anything that you want to speak to or mention that you feel like is either a quality philosophy or even tactics that you feel like are good to, to use as you're trying to build like an audience and true fans? probably nothing that hasn't been said many mm -hmm. times over you know the big stuff is just be true to yourself be genuine um be cool you know mm -hmm. just know know what it is that you're trying to say and 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 make that the priority and make having fun as much of a priority as you can and also recognize that like stuff is hard it takes a long time to build up you know it might require you to in some cases like go on tour if you want to but like the fact that you got to see yousef days i'm thinking is like that's going to entrench you as a fan. You know, if you want to really build a strong following, you got to go where the fans are, you know, I think. And to the degree that you don't want to do that, you got to find other ways, you know, host a virtual, you know, do a live stream of a live set or something from home, you know, if, if that's more comfortable or whatever it is. And sure. I think generally speaking, it's just really important to do it, you know, first and foremost for yourself, uh, make yourself and or your collaborators, you know, if you, if you're doing it as part of a group, stoked and happy and like like really excited to share this music that you're making because that excitement will diffuse into everything you do it will make its way through the people who are listening and they will be excited to share it too so you know if a following is something that you're after you just got to be stoked about what you're doing right that's step one cool man yeah thank you for sharing that so all right man we're getting close here i got a list mm -hmm. of kind of like short, kind of quick hits mm -hmm. that I would like to hit you with. Before we do that, I do want to ask, is there anything that you're working on, whether there are projects coming up, et cetera, that you want to share and let us know? I've got every Monday, I do a stream on Twitch with ChillHop, twitch.tv slash ChillHop Music. We hit Mondays at 3 p.m. at the moment. It's a great hang. There is a solid community of people that come through every week. Funny, funny, talented, like interesting people from all over the country and the world. It's a great hang. Usually I'm, I'm there. We talk about stuff. We talk through like motivation and stuff and creative blocks. And we share, you know, not only advice, but we collaborate and, you know, I'll bring someone's stems on stream and, you know, remix them. And we do all sorts of stuff. A lot of be making on there as well. So if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, come on through. We have a nice weekly, weekly stream and discord and everything. So we'd love to see you there. As far as like releases, I have a few things in the works. 
I don't, I think it would be bad karma to, to talk about, or bad juju to talk about them too much before they materialize. I know how that goes. So I'm going to hold off, but I'm very excited about the music I'm working on right now. So I'm, I'm excited to, to bring that back out to the world. So, and that stream is 3 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. That's correct. If I didn't cool. say that for yeah, it's yeah, 3 p.m. Cool. Eastern. Yeah. yeah, man. So I couldn't recommend enough that you go check this guy out. I mean, he really has so much to teach. And the fact that he's willing to kind of share his doll with you, as well as just general ideas on how to, to stay motivated, please do do check this man out. Oh, thank you, man. Also, man, congrats. I did see, speaking of music, though, I did see that you dropped that remix for Closey, which is super dope. I mean, she's incredible. I was recently watching her Cavern set. Mm. She's incredible, man. Yeah, dude, she's wild. She's really, really cool. I was very honored to be tapped for that project. Yeah, that's really, really cool, man. And like, I mean, also so cool is just like kind of outside of like what we would consider like the lo-fi chill hop scene, right? That's not where she lives. Very much so, yeah. She's, yeah, different, different world. And I guess we didn't really get into it too much, but that's someone I'm connected to more so like from my experience in the live scene, you know, oh, from, cool. from touring. Nice, cool, very cool. Yeah, 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 different. And then are you still giving lessons? Is that something you want to point people to in case they're interested in taking any lessons? Are you accepting students? Absolutely. I'm accepting students. Uh, you can hit me up on Instagram or via email or whatever, just bureaucratic at Gmail. Cool. Um, and uh, yeah, we can kind of go over everything. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of, of the, how to, shit, I should have been sharing a pitch for this, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's from the heart, uh, I, I, I like to coach people through blocks and, and create sort of exercises to practice, you know, working through places in the process where people get stuck. That tends to be my strength and tends to be very helpful for people. So, you know, uh, if you're getting stuck somewhere and you're like, you know, what, I don't know how to move on. Like I, I always get to, man, I always get to mixing and stuff just falls apart. Like, hit me up. There's definitely ways to work through that, that you're going to have the, the, the strength and the power to just like bust through that every time. Right on. Yeah, man. And again, I mean, I, I can vouch and say that, I mean, this guy, this is a guy who knows production, mixing and mastering and beyond. So if it's something that you're interested in, please don't hesitate to reach out. Bureaucratic at Gmail and on Instagram, you're at bureaucratic. Correct. And all right, man, with that, let's jump into these quick hits. I'm sure. going to go ahead and skip the doll. He's already said Ableton. Hopefully you were listening. If not, I've said it for everybody again. Mm. Your go-to sound or instrument? My Fender P bass. Let's go. Hardware, ladies and gentlemen. Go-to plug-in. Ooh. Ah. This, I mean, I use RC20 on everything, man. It's such a, <laughs> it's such a versatile plug-in. You can do so much with it. Favorite piece of gear that isn't the P-Base? Ooh. I'm looking around like I need to refresh my... Right now, this, uh, this little drum kit over here. Nice. Hat and nice. snare. Loving cool. it. And, okay, three producers you think everybody could benefit from listening to. You can't, but, and you can't say Mad Lib, you can't say Dilla, and in your case, I'm also going to add, you can't say Flylo, and you can't say Mind Design. Oh, those are two of mine. Okay, I would say, let's go with DJ Shadow. Uh, let's go with Pete Rock and damn, you had me, you had me peg, bro. That's, that's, <laughs> uh, and I would say DJ Harrison. Oh, dope. yeah. Big fan. Cool. Three favorite albums. Okay. If you'll permit me a flying Lotus album until the quiet comes cool. is an all timer for me. Stash box by DJ Harrison and the soft bulletin by the flaming lips. The soft bulletin. I'm a big Yoshimi fan, but I don't know the soft bulletin. Uh, it came right before Yoshimi. It's okay. it's raw. It's a very raw album. I love it though. I actually got to see them do. They came down here and did Yoshimi not too long ago, and I actually for the first time got to see them. It was pretty great. Oh man, I'm, I'm jealous. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So, someone else you think I should talk to on this podcast? I was thinking about that. I'd love to hear um someone uh, someone who's actually local who I think is is really incredibly talented and does a lot of things very well and is a great community leader is nothing new mm. omar i would love to hear what he has to say about you know his position in the industry right now I, i'd just be very curious i think he just has like a lot of a lot of great wisdom he's someone who's always been a, a pillar of the community here in brooklyn right on man it's funny you say that yeah i'll be talking to him very soon so i'm glad you yeah. feel that way hell yeah. Yeah. yeah let's go yeah so favorite movie random ass movie but uh traffic steven soderbergh came out in 2000 it's um it's it's just been a favorite of mine for a long time Wow, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, wow. 
Okay, what character from a book, movie, show, cartoon, etc., do you most identify with? Damn, bro. Pass. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a good question. I yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe Finn from Adventure Time. Okay. I've never Strong sense of that. adventure, but like a lot of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. And last, if you were to do one thing that would break the internet, what would it be? I would never wish that upon myself. <laughs> uh, I don't need that kind of responsibility in my life. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't want that. I don't want to do whatever it takes to break the internet. I don't want to do it. I hear you, man. It's a lot to, it's a lot of weight to bear. Yeah, I'm good. I like my little life. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Well, that's, that's all I got, man. I mean, I, again, like, thank you so much for making the time. We covered it a lot. And I think people are going to enjoy this regardless of where they are in the industry. And, you know, hopefully just enjoy listening to us talk about music in kind of a more laid back way as well. So thanks for everything that you do, man. And for making the time to be here with me, everybody. I appreciate it so much, Julian. Yeah, right on. Everybody, this has been Tour Win Away, so are you. We'll catch you next time on Producer Head. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode, head over to tourubeat.substack.com and subscribe. This is where you'll be able to find an organized consolidation of each episode of Producer Head, along with full transcripts. You will also receive the Biliqui Podium, a top three curation of my favorite things found on and offline over the past week. It's a one minute read that provides you with a personal soundtrack, ideas, and practical inspiration you can use immediately. So tap in and receive the Biliqui Podium, a top three personally curated by me for free. Again, head to torubeat.substack.com and subscribe so that you don't miss any updates from me and or Producer Head. That's it for this episode of Producer Head. I appreciate you coming through and being a part of it. My hope is that it helps you unlock a bit more creativity and find progress in a way that matters to you. The theme music is one of my own songs. It is called Room to Breathe and available now on all streaming platforms. Again, for real, thank you so much for being here with me. And I look forward to catching you in the next episode of Producer Head. This has been Toru, and in a way, so are you. Peace.